Guys, welcome to another video. You've got Mr. Everything English and today we are covering Jekyll and Hyde. But before we go into Jekyll and Hyde, just two very important announcements. For those of you asking, sir, when are the live streams on Uninspector Calls and the poetry? Guys, we will be covering Uninspector Calls and the poetry on May the 23rd, which is the live stream the day before your English Literature Paper 2 exam. And for those of you asking, sir, what about English language? Are you gonna be doing anything at all for English language? Guys, I will announce the plan for English language after we have finished with our English Literature exams. Now, today, guys, we are doing Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And for those of you who are going to say to me, sir, but the full name is the strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. I know, but I'm going to be calling it Jekyll and Hyde. Now, in this video, guys, I plan on hopefully giving you everything you need for these texts. I'm going to teach it on the basis that you've never covered it before. So I'm going to start from zero and we're going to go all the way up to nine. But I'm going to start from the beginning. First, we're going to go over what is the book about? We're going to cover chapter by chapter by chapter by chapter. Once we cover the entire book, we're then going to be covering a couple of key quotes. Then we're going to be looking at context. Then we're going to be looking at exam papers and how you approach a question on Jekyll and Hyde. And then by the end of the video, hopefully you will have covered everything you need when it comes to Jekyll and Hyde for your exams this year. Now, guys, the video, I'm guessing, is going to end up being pretty long, but I will try to get through everything as quick as possible so I'm not waffling or wasting your time. So, guys, let's begin with chapter one of Jekyll and Hyde. It is called The Story of the Door, but this is not no normal door. You can't find this door in b &Q. This door is a very special door. But before we talk about the door, we are first introduced to our character. Our main character is Utterson. And Utterson is a lawyer who is a little bit lonely. We learn very early that he hasn't got much family and an adjective that is used to describing is the adjective dusty. Now, I've never ever described a human being as being dusty. But if someone's dusty, they've not been touched for a long time. They've been left on a shelf. Now, of course, you can't leave a human being on a shelf, but you get what I'm trying to say here. Utterson is lonely. Utterson is by himself. However, Utterson is a very loyal person. Very, very, very loyal. However, I question this loyalty because we learn that Utterson is a loyal person until the end, until the downfall is the quote of his acquaintance, which is a bit of a weird quote because why would you be loyal to someone until the end, until their downfall? If you're a true friend, if you're a committed friend, you will stop that person from hitting rock bottom. And this is early foreshadowing because which friend of Utterson's has a massive downfall and crashes and burns? It is none other than Henry Jekyll. So keep that in the back of your mind that this is what we learn about Utterson very early on. Now, in this chapter, guys, Utterson very religiously every Sunday goes for a walk with his distant kinsman, Mr. Enfield. And while they are out for a walk, Enfield tells Utterson the story of the door. And the story goes as follows. Enfield says that one night he was coming home from the end of the world. We assume he's been up to no good because all the men have dark hidden secrets in this book that are not really revealed. But we make inference that he was up to no good. And while he was walking home at three in the morning, I believe, he sees two people. He sees a young girl uh, running on the road and he sees a man coming from the opposite direction and kabang they collide in the middle and this man rather than saying oops 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 I have hurt you or let me help you up the quotation goes that this man he trampled calmly over the girl what a savage one absolute savage not only did he trample over her he did it calmly he did it easily he was inflicting pain take that take that take that but you get my point, guys. This guy who is trampling over this girl isn't a nice guy. So that's the guy. And Enfield, when he sees this, 
he can't believe it. He is shocked. And people come out of their houses and they get the girl's family and they grab the man. Enfield talks about how he gripped the man from his collars and they threatened him and they demanded compensation. You better give us some money. So they go with the man to get the money and this man goes to the door and he uses a key, he opens the door, he comes back out of the house with a check and the check is not on his name, the check is on the name of somebody else and he pays them off, peace out, see you later. And in this chapter guys, Utterson questions him and Utterson says to him, are you sure about two things. Are you sure that he used a key to get into the house? Because number one, if he used a key, that means he has access to the house. Question is, whose house is he going to? Number two, they talk about um, the name on the check. And Enfield says, sorry mate, I can't tell you that um, because it's a secret. And that is left as a question mark. Now this little dude guys who's trampling over the girl, he was Hyde and the check on the book, this was Jekyll's. But we learn these things about Jekyll later, but initially guys, that is the character of Hyde. And that is what happened in chapter one. Hyde tramples over the girl. We learn that there's a relationship between him and this house, which he enters via the door. And we learn that um, he is able to get some other person to pay him the money to pay off the family. And that is chapter one. Chapter two, guys, is the search for Mr. Hyde. Now, Utterson goes home and he's a bit troubled by what he's seen. So he takes out a will and this will is the will of Jekyll because he suspects that Jekyll and Hyde have some link. And he opens the will and in the will, we learn that Jekyll has written that if something happens to me, then everything I own should go to Hyde. Hmm. Something strange is up. Jekyll is giving everything to Hyde and Utterson has just learned that Hyde is trampling over girls. So he's a bit confused, he's a bit confused and he's a bit worried. That night, Mr. Utterson goes to bed and he has a terrible nightmare. He has a nightmare of essentially Hyde being, sorry, Jekyll being controlled by Hyde, again foreshadowing. Then guys, Utterson becomes obsessed. Utterson becomes obsessed. Not only is he a lawyer, but in this part of the text, he is behaving like a detective. So what does he do? He stands and he watches the door, waiting. He's waiting for Hyde to come one day and open the door so he can approach him. So after waiting and waiting and waiting, he finally sees Hyde one night opening the door and he goes and he stops him and he is shocked. He's flabbergasted by the appearance of Hyde. And every character that meets Hyde says that there's something wrong with this guy, but we're not quite sure why. And Hyde says the exact, sorry, Jack from Utterson says the exact same thing. There's something up with this guy, but I'm not sure why. And the point you want to make here is Hyde is disfigured. Hyde is wrong, but it's not because it's a visual impairment. He's wrong to the core. So it's that feeling you get when you know something is up, but you just can't pinpoint where it is. And that is what you, what you want to say at this point in the text. Every character that meets Hyde understands that there's something up with this guy. There's something not normal. So guys, he finds Hyde and he, 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 he is convinced that Hyde is blackmailing Jekyll. And that is why Jekyll is helping Hyde because he's a lovely friend would never be involved in anything bad, never. Then we move on to chapter number three. And in chapter number three, guys, is when we get to know a little bit more about our friend, Mr. Jekyll. Chapter three is called Dr. Jekyll was quite at ease. And in this chapter, Jekyll is hosting a party and his friend Utterson goes to the party. And Utterson questions Jekyll about the will because he's not happy with it. And Jekyll says to him, look, relax. It's fine. What you're thinking isn't true. And I'm not being blackmailed. And he compares Hyde's, sorry, Utterson's worries to Lanyon's concerns about Jekyll as a scientist. And he just said, look guys, you guys are being too much. It's nothing. I'm fine. But then he says to Utterson, two things that are very important. Number one, he reminds him that if something happens to me, 
make sure you carry out my will. Make sure everything that I have goes to hide. And this shows the importance of this. Jekyll is not saying, look, forget about it. It's not that important. He says, look, I don't care what you think about him or I don't care what your assumptions are. Make sure Hyde gets everything that I own. And then he says in a very famous quote um, that he can be rid of Hyde whenever he wishes to. Now, this quote comes back later and bites Jekyll right in the bum. But for now, guys, you want to just understand that in the first three chapters of our text, the, the, the landscape has now been set. We know Hyde is not a good guy. We know Utterson suspects that something is up. And we know that Jekyll is being a little bit fishy because he's not telling us what's wrong. But at the same time, he's making sure that what he wants to happen actually happens. Then we move on to chapter number four. After setting the scene, guys, chapter four is the Karoo murder case. And we've moved on by almost a year. And similar to the story of the door, this chapter is also set in the dark of the night. And the story goes, guys, that the maid or a maid of a house went upstairs and she's looking down upon the street. And she tells the story of what she saw. And what she saw was a horrific crime. She says that she saw Sir Danvers Carew, a rich, powerful member of society, walking down the street. And on the other side, she saw somebody walking the other way. No guesses who. These two men came face to face. And as Carew said hello, Hyde, who was the other man, he got a cane and he battered Carew. He smacked and he destroyed Carew. Carew fell to the ground and then he continued the blows over and over. And it talks about how you could hear the bones cracking. Vicious, vicious murder. Wasn't a stabbing of a knife. Wasn't a gunshot. But it was a battering. As though there is a deep hatred between these two men. So Hyde has now killed. From trampling over young girls, his evil has grown. And he has now killed. And on Karoo, guys, they find a letter that was addressed to Utterson. So the cops and whatnot, they end up at the house of Utterson. And when Utterson looks at the murder weapon, he realizes that this is a cane that he gave to Jekyll um, as a present. They then go, so he, he says this must be Hyde. They then go to Hyde's uh, living quarters. And when they search the living quarters, they find that they find the other half of the cane. So Hyde doesn't really do a good job in covering his tracks. And then they wait to find Hyde, but there's no sign of Hyde ever again. Nothing. Now, there's two important things I want to know about Hyde's victims. A young girl, absolutely helpless. And one of the most innocent, or well, I think a young girl is the most innocent beings of society. Then he targets an old man, again, helpless and innocent, but the old man's rich and powerful. The girl's poor and helpless. In the two people that Hyde attacks, there's something to be said here. You could argue that in attacking the young girl, Hyde highlights a fundamental flaw in society in the 19th century. Him trampling calmly over the girl, for me, echoes how society, a capitalist society, tramples calmly over poor people like this girl all of the time. Their lives are terrible. And when Hyde attacks Sir Danvers Carew, it's almost as though he attacks the people who are responsible for the suffering of people like this innocent girl. Chapter five, guys, is the incident of the letter. And this is now when Utterson visits Jekyll um, at his home. And Jekyll looks absolutely mashed up. He looks sick, he looks pale, he looks ill, he looks weak. And Utterson says to him, listen, have you spoken to Hyde? Have you heard of Hyde? And Jekyll is like, nope, I have not seen him. He wrote me this letter. Um, 
to say that he's done and we're, 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 we're splitting and have a look. And Jekyll gives Utterson the letter. Now, on the way out, Utterson asks Jekyll's um, butler, who gave or who bring this letter to the house? And he's like, what letter? What are you talking about? No one's been to the house. So this sparks some suspicion for Utterson. So Utterson goes to visit Mr. Guest, who's an expert at handwriting. And he gives him the letter and he gives him a, so he gives him a letter that was supposedly written by Hyde. And then he gives him writing that was written by Jekyll. And he said, compare the handwriting and tell me if it's different or if it's the same person. And the man, Mr. Guest, he confirms that the writing is very, very similar. So Utterson suspects that Jekyll forged this letter and wrote this letter pretending to be Hyde. So his link with Hyde is finished. So people think Hyde and him are done. But what does Utterson do about it? Nothing, absolutely nothing. But all the red flags are there. That Jekyll is being shady, Jekyll is lying, Jekyll is being suspicious. All these red flags are there, but still nothing. And this is a perfect time to talk about the structure of a 19th century Gothic genre text. As you can see guys right now, suspense is building and building and building and building and building. This, oh, this, this is how 19th century Gothic genre text were structured until the very end, which is the big reveal, and then the books would finish. Chapter number six, guys, is the remarkable incident of Dr. Lanyon. And this chapter begins with the reader being told that Jekyll is out in full force. He's doing so much more charity work. He is doing so much good out in the community, which is a bit of a question mark because it raises the question, why is he being outwardly so good? And Hyde still is nowhere to be found. Then as time passes, um, Utterson tries to see Jekyll and it's the reversed. From being super happy, we learn that Jekyll has fallen into a slumber. Jekyll is sad, depressed, and he's not seeing nobody. Now, being worried about his friend, Utterson goes to see Lanyon. Lanyon is the friend also, and Lanyon is the other scientist. And Lanyon, this guy is also sick and pale and worried. And he says to Utterson, that look, my life's done, I'm, gonna, I'm finished. What I've seen, what I've experienced, is too much but i can't tell you then guys utterson weeks later he receives news that lanyon has passed away but lanyon has left him a letter and if this letter guys he has written that it cannot and it should not be opened until the death and the disappearance of one jekyll so out of respect utterson takes the letter puts it into his safe but he doesn't open it hmm is that what he really should have done, guys? Question that, question that, question that. It says, don't open this letter until Jekyll disappears or dies. Now, if that happened to me, I've got love for Lanyon. I've got love for my friend. But you're telling me that read this once our other friend dies or disappears. I'm probably going to open it because look, you're dead. So stay over there. I'm going to help my friend who's alive. But Utterson does not do that. And at this point, guys, I want you to question the character of Utterson. Does he not open the letter because he's a loyal friend? Or is it something more? Is it because he's scared of finding out the truth? And he's scared that he will be forced to kind of get a little bit more involved. But nonetheless, the text carries on and the tension continues to build and the kettle continues to boil. So guys, after Lanyon dies, we then move on to chapter seven, which is incident at the window. And in this chapter, Utterson and Enfield, like they were in chapter one, are out for a walk. And they come outside of Jekyll's quarters. And, not, not Jekyll, yeah, Jekyll's quarters. And Utterson wants to see Jekyll, but Jekyll refuses to come outside. But he's up there in the window. So you've got three windows. You've got one window that's closed. You've got another window that is closed. The, the one in the middle, is open halfway. Now that could be talked about as being symbolic of the idea of having a split personality. And to cut it short guys, Jekyll is talking to Utterson Enfield from the window and for a split second, 
something happens that makes the hairs on Utterson and Enfield stand on edge. Jekyll, his face changes. He looks evil. He looks dark. He looks like Hyde for a split second. And when that happens, the window slams shut. And that is the chapter incident at the window. Then guys, we move on to chapter number eight, and this is called The Last Night. So Poole is Jekyll's butler. He visits Utterson and he says, look, something's wrong. I'm a little bit stressed. Come and give us a hand because I'm worried about Jekyll. So they go to Jekyll's house and they go to the back of the garden, which is the laboratory. Now I'm cutting this part really short, guys. They go to the laboratory and the door's shut and the person on the other side is um, begging for them not to come in. And Utterson recognises and Poole recognises that this isn't Jekyll's voice, but instead it's the voice of Hyde. So they, after, coming, after giving it some thought, they decide that we're going to smash the door down. So bang, 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 door goes down. They enter Jekyll's laboratory and they find on the floor dead um, Hyde. Hyde's body, guys, is twitching on the floor and they believe that Hyde has committed suicide. Now they search the laboratory, they have a look around because they believe Jekyll has to be somewhere here. Looking, 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 they can't find Jekyll anywhere in the lab. All they've got is Hyde's twitching body on the floor. Then uh, Utterson finds a will from Jekyll and he finds a letter that is also written from Jekyll. So Hyde is dead, Jekyll can't be found, meaning Jekyll is now disappeared. So Utterson, takes the letter and he goes back home. And now he has two letters to read. He must read Dr. Lanyon's letter, which was supposed to be read once Jekyll dies or disappears. And then he will read the letter that Jekyll has left. And this is when we move on to the next chapter. And now our story begins to tie up and make sense. So guys, chapter nine is word for word, Dr. Lanyon's narrative of what happened. So Lanyon tells Utterson via the letter that one day, um, he received a letter from Jekyll telling him to go to his lab and to pick up these chemicals and to take them back with him and that somebody will come and collect them. So Lanyon goes to the lab, Lanyon gets the chemicals and Lanyon comes back. Now remember guys, this is all being told through the letter. And then Lanyon says that a man came to visit him. Small, ugly, evil looking man. Now obviously guys, this man was Hyde and Hyde takes the chemicals off from Lanyon. And Hyde says to Lanyon, look, do you want to be here to see what happens next? Because there's no going back. And Lanyon says, look, I'm this far involved. I might as well now see it through. So Hyde takes the chemicals and essentially guys, Hyde transforms from Hyde into Jekyll. And that's the first revelation. Now, of course we know this, but that's the first time it's clearly revealed that Hyde and Jekyll are the same, that Jekyll and Hyde are the one same human being. So that has now been found out. So if Hyde is dead, Jekyll is dead. If Jekyll is dead, Hyde is dead. Then we turn to the last chapter, which is Henry Jekyll's full statement of the case. And now we learn from Jekyll what happened. Jekyll says, guys, how Hyde was a creation born out of curiosity. Jekyll created Hyde because he was curious and he wanted to split his desires. Every man innately has two desires, simple ones, good and bad. And Jekyll says that he wanted to house his bad in a different being, but under his control. So when he wanted to be good, Jekyll is who he is. But then when he wanted to do bad, it wouldn't be through Jekyll, rather it would be through Hyde. But as one of occurrences, just to enjoy a bit of freedom, just to be free for a little while. But what happened? As time went on, from trampling over the girl to murdering Saddam with Karoo, to eventually taking his life, the evil side of Jekyll, which is Hyde, grew more and more and more powerful until it overpowered Jekyll's good side. And once it overpowered Jekyll's good side, guys, Jekyll became an addict to evil. Jekyll became an addict to doing bad. And hence, he lost all control of Hyde. 
resulting in the disastrous ending of the text. Now, what does this text tell us, guys? It tells us the following. Human beings are not capable of creating other human beings. Jekyll, in trying to create Hyde, went against religion at that time. And it showed us the idea that if allowed to, human beings will succumb to their desires, good or bad, and become slaves to their evil side. Second part, the prophecy of Utterson became true. Utterson was loyal and he was loyal with, to Jekyll until the very end, until his absolute downfall. But he did nothing to prevent it. Like a passenger watching a movie or like a person watching a movie, he watched every single scene. He watched every single chapter play out in front of him, but he did nothing to intervene. And that is the entire text, guys, summed up in a nutshell. That is what the text Jekyll and Hyde is about. Now, guys, I want to go over a few key quotes when it comes to our text. So guys, now that we've been over the text, I want to go over these three quotes as quick as possible, but in a way where you're able to benefit from them. Now, in our exam, we are going to be given an extract. Now, from the extract, we're going to pull two quotes, which means we then do two more paragraphs about the whole text using two quotes that we've learned. Now, these are three quotes that I think are very good to use and learn in preparation from the exam. Now, let's begin, guys, with trample calmly. The technique, guys, being used here is an oxymoron. And if you zoom in, guys, zoom in to the adverb calmly. Now, why have I picked this quote? Because this quote from the very beginning of the text sets a precedent. This guy is an absolute savage. He is an absolute weirdo. Now, obviously, guys, don't say he's a weirdo in the exam, but you get what I mean. Why? Because Hyde has no mercy. Hyde has no feeling. Hyde has no emotion. Hyde tramples calmly. He enjoys it. He enjoys excruciating pain among his victims. So he trampled calmly over this girl. Now this quote links beautifully guys to the quote ape like fury. Now here of course we have our simile. Now the ape here guys I want you to use symbolism. Now how are we linking our quotes? Now hear me out guys. This text was published in the 19th century and Darwin was popping off back then. So people were believing and people were beginning to believe that human beings evolved from apes and so on. So imagine here's Jekyll on the theory of evolution and behind Jekyll, we have Hyde and behind Hyde, we have various iterations of monkeys and apes. The fact that his fury is described to an ape, it implies that Hyde is not a fully evolved human being. He has the raw animal instincts inside him. He has the raw instincts of his forefathers that they claim he evolved from. But let's take it one step further. How does the if theory of evolution goes? You had monkey, 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 ape, whatever. Then you had Hyde, then you had Jekyll. The fact that his fury his evilness is compared to what human beings were believed to have evolved from implies that every single human being deep inside them has this animalistic evil nature. That is why he was able to walk calmly over the girl because innately, what is every human being then? Every human being is innately evil. Every human being, guys, has dark and deep desires. Because that is what we came from. That is what we evolved from. If you believe in the theory of evolution. So that is how you link these two texts. Let's take it further. Which characteristic did we keep? It doesn't say that Hyde was swinging off the trees. And that's the characteristic he, 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 he maintained. He maintained the fury. He maintained the anger. He maintained the evilness. 
And guys, that is how you want to link these quotes and understand the character of Hyde. In creating Hyde, Jekyll created a devolved version of himself, a lesser human being of himself. And the manifestation was Hyde, who is all and utter evilness. However, guys, the third quote is your juxtaposition. The third quote, guys, the quote in itself is rule of three. But the quote, when looked at in the context of the whole play, sorry, on the whole book, is juxtaposition. Why? The first time Jekyll became Hyde, the first time Jekyll devolved, Jekyll became ugly, evil, less of a human. He says he felt younger, he felt lighter, and he felt happier. Does it make sense? How can, how can becoming Hyde make you happier, make you feel better? Now, this quote, guys, I want you to use it to reflect the problems in 19th century society. Jekyll was carrying the pressure of being good. At all times, Jekyll had to be good. Too many expectations, too much um, public opinion around this man. So the weight of being good weighed heavily on his shoulders. So to be free, to be happy, he was forced to create a hide where he can do everything he wanted without impacting the character of Jekyll. And that's a reflection of the society, where society was far too um, uh, scraping, far too judgmental, that he had to be super good at all times. So guys, when we look at these three quotes, I want you to look at the idea of, how, number one, who is Hyde? And number two, why Jekyll did what he did. And this, guys, is now where I bring in one piece of context that I would like you all to use in your exam when it comes to this text. Just one. Now you have loads of context that you can use. You have patriarchy, you have class, rich and the poor, you have religion. But the one context that I want you to use for your exam is the following. You're gonna be doing four paragraphs. You need context once in the entire essay, two if you wanna push it. The one context that I want you all to use is from a dude called Freud. Freud spoke about or wrote about the human brain. And he said that the human brain has three parts. And the only part of the brain that I want you guys to speak about is the part that he called the id. That's it. It's called the id. Sounds fancy, sounds complicated, but trust me, it's not. What is the id? He said that the id part of our brain is the part of the brain that controls our raw human desires. What are desires, what are instincts that all of us have? Hunger is one of them. All of us get hungry. So what do we do? We eat. All of us have the instinct to survive. If somebody breaks through that door right now and threatens my life, I'm either going to do one of two things. I'm either going to go that way and fight them or I'm going to jump out of that window. I'm not going to stand here and just say, fine, go ahead. I'm making a video, carry on killing me. My survival instinct won't allow that to happen. But then we have other instincts, the instinct of worship, where every human being worships. It doesn't mean you worship God. Some worship God. Some worship Kim Kardashian. Some worship cars. Some worship money. You pick your vice. But the instinct of worship, he argued, is in every single one of us. And that's the instinct that I want you guys to focus on. And all I want you guys to say in your exam 
depending upon the question, is that when we look at Freud's theory of the brain, the characters in our text are slaves to their id. They are slaves to their desire. Now, which desire specifically are they slaves to? It's the desire of worship. Jekyll worships the idea of being free. Hence, he creates Hyde. He's dying to be free. At the same time, you can argue he's worshipping power because that's what Hyde gives him. Hyde gives him a level of control, a level of power that he can never get as Jekyll. How about Hyde? What does Hyde worship? Guys, Hyde worships pure and utter evilness. He's a slave to his desires. If Hyde hates you, Hyde will hate you. If Hyde wants to kill you, Hyde will kill you. Because there's no moral compass. There's no, for example, somebody might make me angry and I'd be like, okay, you know what? Don't shout because it's rude. Maybe talk about it. Hyde, don't give a monkeys. It's because he's a slave to his desires. He worships himself and he worships his evil side a little bit too much. So guys, use it in your exam. It's a very good piece of context. There's one model answer, guys, that was published by AQA um, that got a grade nine for Jekyll and Hyde. And that student used Freud in the exam. So we've now covered key events. We've, couple, we've covered a couple of quotes. Now we've also covered context. Now I wanna go over how does this text appear in your exam? What do you do? How many paragraphs? How do you structure the paragraphs? And where do you put in the context? And where do you put in the quotes? So guys, now I'm gonna shift onto the board and we are now gonna end this video by zooming in to everything about Jekyll and Hyde in relation to our exam on May the 17th. These are the past papers when it comes to Jekyll and Hyde for the past couple of years. So the question for this one was, uh, Steve's uh, presentation of Dr. Jekyll allowed the reader to feel sympathy for Jekyll. <coughs> how far do you agree? And the year after, guys, we were looking at how Stevenson creates mystery and tension. The year after that, guys, we were looking at how Stevenson presents Hyde as inhuman and disturbing. And the year after that, which is last year, guys, we were looking at how Stevenson presents Jekyll as a mysterious character. So as you can see, guys, it's a bit of ping pong between Jekyll as a character, Hyde as a character, um, and then the theme of mystery and tension. Now, Utterson hasn't come up, which is an interesting uh, character because he may make an appearance this year. Now, when we look at every single year, guys, you will notice the following. You are given a question and you are asked to start with the extract. And every year you are given an extract. And this is what takes me to the structure of what we have to do in our exam. In our exam, guys, for this particular question, we have 40 minutes to write and we have 10 minutes to plan. Now, what are we doing here? In the 40 minutes of writing, we are aiming to complete four pretzel paragraphs. And these four pretzel paragraphs have to confidently address AO1, AO2, and AO3. Now, AO1 essentially, guys, looks at your point and it looks at your reference, meaning it looks at the quotes we are using. Now, two of our quotes will come from the extract and two of our quotes will hopefully come from the whole text because this is what you've been revising for. Now, once we picked out our quotes, we have to analyze the effect. Now, what do we analyze the effect of? We analyze the effect of language devices. We analyze the effect of structural devices and we analyze the effect of the form of the text. Now, once we've done this, guys, the last AO that we focus on is context. Now, we just discussed this earlier, guys. When it comes to context for this exam, I would like you all to talk about Freud and his discussion of the id. Um, so that is how we're going to take off AO3. 
when it comes to AO1, every paragraph we do will have a point and a quote. Now, how do we tick off language, structure, and form? Let's now, guys, go over the bigger picture of how we're going to make sure that our four paragraphs tick off the entire mark scheme. Aiming to complete four paragraphs. Paragraph one will be from and about the extract. Paragraph two will be about the whole text. Paragraph three will be about the extract. And paragraph four, guys, will be about the whole text. That is the structure of our essay. Extract, whole text, extract, whole text. 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes, totaling 40 minutes. Now, the structure of our essay, guys, as you're aware, the structure of our essay, guys, is the following. It is P, R, T, E, Z, E, and L times four. In paragraph one, guys, this is what I would like you to do. In paragraph one, when you are analyzing, I would like you for your technique, I would like you all to pick out a language device. And when you zoom in, I would like you to zoom in either to a noun, a verb, an adjective, or an adverb. Then in paragraph number two, I want you all to do the exact same thing. I would like you all to pick out a language device as your technique, and I would like you to zoom in to either a noun, verb, an adverb, or an adjective. However, guys, it is in this paragraph that after you've explained the effect of your first technique, I would like you to bring in your first context. I would like you to bring in the id between your first effect and when you zoom in. Then in paragraph number three, guys, in paragraph number three, what I would like you to do, please, is the following. For your technique, I would like you to please pick a structural technique. And then when you zoom in, I would like you to discuss the form of the text. Now, when I say structural technique, what am I talking about, guys? You've got foreshadowing, you've got flashback, you've got frame narrative, you've got the pathetic fallacy that runs throughout the entire text. You can use all of these different devices. An easy one, guys, an easy one that I would personally use for this text, I would use pathetic fallacy, which is when the weather reflects the mood, but the reason it's a structural device here is because I would talk about how the fog throughout the text builds up. So the more evil Hyde becomes, the thicker the fog becomes. And then guys, when you look at the form of the text, we know that this text is a Gothic genre novel. So talk about the idea of either the dark and supernatural theme, or talk about the idea of how in a convention of the gothic genre is how there is a big reveal at the very end. So by the end of paragraph number three, we've done language, 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 structure, form, context. If we go back to our mark scheme, by the end of paragraph number three, we've pretty much ticked off the entire mark scheme. We've done language, we've done structure, we've done context, we've now also done AO1. However, there's a fourth paragraph there. Now, in this fourth paragraph, guys, you may pick whatever you want. Because we've done the mark scheme, now we're getting brownie points. So when it comes to your technique, you pick either a language device or you pick either a structural device. And when it comes to zooming in, you decide, are you going to zoom into a language device, a structural device, or a noun, verb, or adjective? Now, if you want to talk about context twice, in this paragraph is where you bring in your second piece of context. This could be Freud, sorry, this could be patriarchy, this could be gender, this could be class. You decide where and what you want to bring in. But guys, this is the structure of an essay on Jekyll and Hyde for your exam. Let's recap. In your exam, you are most likely going to be doing an essay on either Hyde, Utterson or Jekyll. The structure for your exam is you have 10 minutes to plan and you have 40 minutes to write. 
So this plan you see in the board behind me, you can do that in 10 minutes in your exam. Throughout these four paragraphs, we have to address AO1 and AO2 and AO3. AO1, you will hopefully naturally address because every paragraph will have a detailed point with an appropriate reference, with an appropriate quote. Now, if you want to know how to write a point and how to pick a quote, then I would suggest you go watch my video on how you write pretzel paragraphs. But this video is about Jekyll and Hyde. Then, after we've picked our quote, we then have to find a technique in each of our quotes. We're going to look for two language techniques and one structural technique. Now, the reason we begin with a language technique is because it's always easier to find a language technique. And I don't want you guys sitting there wasting time, getting stuck, not being able to begin your exam. So get going. But it's not a set in stone rule. If there are structural devices staring you in the face, then do structure, structure language. But mix it up. But make sure that by the time you get to the end of paragraph three, you've got a variety of language and structure, not just language. Now, when we zoom in, over here, we're going to zoom into a noun or a verb because we're going to give a close and thorough analysis. And the same thing happens there. But this paragraph, we're going to wedge context in between. Now, the reason we're not going to do context at the end, because the context has to be relevant. So we're going to embed it within our explanation, link it to whatever you are talking about. Now, again, if you think Freud fits better over here, then don't be so strict. I say paragraph two. If you want to do in paragraph one, do it in paragraph one. Just do it once. So that's the end of paragraph number two. Now, the reason I've left paragraph three for structure and form is because they tend to go quite well together. In paragraph three, guys, try to talk about pathetic fallacy as a structural device um, in your exam. I talk about the fog and how the fog gets thicker and thicker and thicker, especially before Saddam vs. Karu is murdered. And you can link it to the idea of um, nature supporting the evilness and reflecting the evilness of Hyde um, and so on. Then, guys, when you talk about form, talk about the gothic genre of this book, how the weather ties in with the form. A gothic genre book doesn't have sunshine and rainbows. It has dark, foggy atmospheres. So the form supports the structure. So if we follow this plan, by the end of paragraph three, we've now done everything we need for AO1, AO2 AO, and AO3, which allows us to stand a chance of getting a grade seven, eight or nine, because to get the top end, you have to do language and structure and form, as it says clearly in the mark scheme. You can't just do language and ignore the other two. That leaves us in paragraph number four. The reason we do a fourth paragraph is because the exam boards recommend you to do three to five paragraphs. The sweet spot is the fourth in the middle. In this fourth paragraph, because you've now done language and structure and context, you do what you are comfortable with. If you want to pick out a language device, a structural device, a noun, a verb, an adjective, whatever you want, this is the paragraph where you have that freedom. And if you want to do context again, this is the paragraph you do it. Bring in patriarchy. Talk about how there's no women who have a voice in this text. You might talk about class and talk about the idea that we learn there's a massive class divide in society. You might learn religion or you might talk about religion and how in this text, we learn the dangers of abandoning your religion. You decide whatever context you want to chuck in. But if you want to do it twice, leave it until the last paragraph. Now, if you follow the structure behind me, by the end of your exam, guys, you will have written a beautiful essay on Jekyll and Hyde. Now, this video, guys, I'm not sure how long it is now, but it seems pretty long. What I would advise you to do is the following. If you've watched the entire video, you've now got a clear summary of what happens in the book. You've got context that you're going to use in your exam and you've got some quotes that you can use. Make sure you've got some of your own. And now finally, you know what's come up in the exam for Jekyll and Hyde and you know the structure of the essay that you are writing. This is what I would do now going forward. Rewind the video to where I went over the past papers. I went over the four questions for the past four years. Now, try to answer those questions using this structure. So there was a question about tension. There was a question about Hyde being an unlikable character. Go for it. 
get two paragraphs that you plan from the extract and two paragraphs that you plan from the whole text and see how you get on with this. All right, guys, I hope you found some benefit in this video. I hope you enjoyed the video. As always, guys, thank you so much for your support. It's been Mr. Everything English. Peace.